Hey, it's Lou Bartone, and welcome to Blabapalooza, the Video Engagement Summit. Now, I put this interview series together and this uh, sort of mini summit together to get some of the best and brightest in the industry, some early adopters, some folks who are really uh, doing amazing things in the video space, and particularly when it comes to video streaming and video engagement. There are a lot of options out there now. There are a lot of new platforms. Blab and Periscope and Meerkat and Facebook and YouTube. So I brought all of these experts together to help us, to help you and me, learn about these platforms, how we can use them, what's the best way to use them, and all kinds of cool tips and tricks to help you out. So check out the interviews. It's the, like I say, the best experts in the business who are really on the cutting edge of this stuff. So enjoy the interview series and I look forward to seeing you inside. Thanks. Welcome to Blabapalooza, the Video Engagement Summit. And I am thrilled and delighted to have my friend, colleague, mentor, coach here, Michael Port, who is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Steal the Show and New York Times bestselling author of six books. Um, I have my copy. It's very dog-eared and, and already getting broken in. But again, thanks for being here, Michael, and thanks for talking to us about engaging on video. You are welcome. How, how long have we known each other now? Is it seven years? Seven years, yep. It's a long time. Yes. You yes. keep getting better looking every year. Oh, that's nice, thank you. Whereas <laughs> I am just going downhill year after year after year. I don't know about that. <laughs> so um, we saw you a few weeks ago in New York, which was awesome, uh, talking about the book and stealing the show. And I've you know, kind of seen the genesis of this, which has been really fun and exciting to see. But, you know, I approach things more from a performance on video standpoint. But let me ask, first ask, in terms of stealing the show, you know, why is it so important to steal the show? Why do we have to make the most of these performances in life? Yeah, so steal the show is not just focused on public speaking from a stage. I mean, it's a tour de force uh, on public speaking technique from a true performer's perspective, from an actor's perspective. But if you think about life, mm -hmm. life is made up of lots of high stakes situations. And the way that you perform during life's high stakes situations determines the quality of your life. So if you fall flat when the stakes are high, well then you, you, you live a small life. But if you, can, if you can shine when the spotlight's on you, well, then you can do big things in the world. And that's what's exciting. So performance is part of our everyday life. A job interview is a performance. A sales meeting with a potential client is a performance. A negotiation is a performance. Obviously, what I'm doing right now is a performance. Sometimes people equate performance with phoniness or being fake. But... Good performance is not about fake behavior. Good performance is authentic behavior in a manufactured environment. And all of those scenarios, all of those situations that I just mentioned are manufactured environments. I mean, this is certainly a very manufactured environment. I mean, there's a, this is a set. If you look on the other side of the camera, it's a mess. Uh, but this, this looks quite nice. A job interview is a manufactured situation. It's, it's designed by the person doing the interview, asking you specific questions, putting you on the spot. You're supposed to prove yourself uh, and you know, demonstrate that you're worthy of the job. It's manufactured. A negotiation is a manufactured situation. One person wants one thing, one person wants another, and they're trying to figure out uh, how to get it from each other. And then, of course, uh, even a first date is a manufactured environment. It's this weird thing where you don't know each other, your friend set you up, you've heard some things about each other, you're not sure, uh, or it's, you've met online. I mean, meeting your in-laws for the first time, it's this intense type situation that has an element of, of, uh, uh, of discomfort mm -hmm. that is often present. And the best performers in the world are the ones who are comfortable with discomfort. And that's what's really important. Sorry, I don't know why that happened. That's okay. There we go. Okay. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's one of the things that the performer does very well. The performer is able to be very authentic in these situations that are 
typically uncomfortable and the performer is very comfortable with discomfort. Uh, that's why uh, we're really, really focused here on helping people perform better in all aspects of their life. Mm -hmm. So when people say, okay, you got to put on your game face, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be somebody else or... or no, of course not. Now, you. the beautiful thing is, and this may, this may take a, a little bit of thought, because the beautiful thing is that a great performer has elements of, of a chameleon in them. But a chameleon is very authentic. A chameleon is not inauthentic. When a chameleon is on a red leaf, it turns red. When a chameleon turns, when it's on a green leaf, it turns green. But it's not pretending to turn green or pretending to turn red. <laughs> right. It's actually turning red and green. Mm -hmm. It's part of their biolog biology. It's, it's completely normal for them to do that. And what we do as human beings is we often define ourselves. We create this persona, this rigidly fixed idea of who we are and what we believe. And we are so true to self sometimes that we can't get out of that, con those constraints and allow ourselves to take on different roles, to play different roles in different situations, to play mm -hmm. the right role in every situation so that you can fit into different groups, you can fit into, uh, into different scenarios, different dynamics. You can bring different energies and different styles of behavior to lots of different situations. And as a result, you are more accepted. You're more compelling, you're more interesting. People want you to be there. Mm -hmm. you know, something as simple as, you know, if you have strong political beliefs and you cannot leave, if you cannot leave those beliefs at the door when you're in a room of people who have different beliefs, but you're not there to have any political discussion whatsoever. You have an agenda to accomplish something, but you can't leave your political beliefs at the door. You're not going to accomplish that agenda, most likely. Mm -hmm. And each one of us has an agenda. We all have an agenda. Most things we're doing, when we're putting our kid to bed at night, we have an agenda. We want that kid to go to bed. They don't want to go to bed. We've got to get them to go to bed. Mm -hmm. When we're in a sales meeting, we have an agenda. When we're working with a client, we have an agenda. When I, I'm doing this right now, I have an agenda. My agenda is to deliver on my promises and hopefully get people to buy a copy of Steal the Show. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having an agenda. And I think the more open you are about your agenda, the more honest you are about it, the more people appreciate you. Because they know, yes, of course, everybody's got an agenda. Mm -hmm. And so one of, the, one of the things that I really work on with folks in Steal the Show is understanding how to get very clear about what you're trying to accomplish as a performer and then picking the right strategies and tactics to do it that are in line with your style, with your personality, with your values. Still, you don't ever, you don't ever go against your values. You, know, you don't mm -hmm. jump off the bridge because someone else wants you to jump off the bridge to be a performer. You, know, you still are true to your underlying values. But if you're too rigid, you know, then, uh, then we often have a, a problem. So what we're doing is we're trying to go after what we want in a way that serves our agenda and the people in the room. And that's a big part of performance. Yeah. And how do you, you know, shift the performance or prepare for different platforms? Like obviously speaking on stage is a different energy than speaking on video. But if you're on something like a blab, for instance, which we've been talking a lot about, and you're maybe one of four squares on that blab, yeah. I've seen people show up for those and they think, okay, well, I'm home, you know, I'm in my pajamas or whatever. They think they don't really have to, you know, bring it because it's yeah. lab or hangout. How do you prepare for those types of platforms? Sure. So, for example, right now I'm looking into the camera lens. My computer yeah. is down here mm -hmm. and you are down here. But my, I use a really nice camera, a high-end camera. Yeah. Uh, you can see that it creates a, has a really nice um, uh, uh, a look to it. And you can also tell that uh, my set, and I'm, I have a special room in my house that is a set for video. Yep. And we have another room that's a set for audio. And uh, it's designed. But I'm looking at the camera. I don't see any face whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I have to imagine your face. Oh, I, I have to that. hear you. <laughs> yeah? And your face is gorgeous right now. It's <laughs> fantastic. I have to hear you and respond to what I'm hearing 
is if I'm seeing your facial expressions. And I have to work to get the lens, which is the person who's watching at home, to respond to what I'm saying. And I'm doing that with my face, my eyes. And that is a very specific skill set to develop. And it's often uncomfortable, it's difficult because you're looking at this lens and you're supposed to, you're also, you need to be able to think and be spontaneous and very natural, yet you're just looking at a tiny little lens. Right. So we spend a lot of time in our work uh, at heroicpublicspeaking.com focusing on working not just on the stage, but also in front of the camera because it is a different medium and we need to interact with it in different ways. So once again, there's the manufactured environment. Yeah. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing you asked about is Blab and some of these other platforms. You know, I've done two Blabs mm -hmm. and they were really quite fun. And they're like Periscope, except more people can get on them. And, right. you know, it's the platform du jour and maybe <laughs> interesting in a year, maybe it won't, don't know. I don't really care. That's not, you know, my, my job is not to debate, you know, which platform is the cool platform. But I see not just on Blab, but I see this at conferences as well. And I address this in Still the Show, dressing, what you wear, the choices you make, because everything that you do says something about you. Yep. You can say anything that you want, but what you do will tell the world more about you. It's your actions that make the difference. It's your actions that either build or hurt your reputation. And sometimes in our world, we, we, we make the assumption that authenticity is about being grungy. <laughs> authenticity is, oh, look, I'm just in my house right. with my pajamas, uh, and it looks like a big mess, and, but I'm really showing you me. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying that's not a good thing from time to time in the right situation, but let's always make sure that it's a choice and we know exactly why we are making the choices that we make because great performers make strong choices and they know why they're making those choices. That is a big part of performance. So when you go out and give a speech or when you set the stage here for a video or when you choose what you're gonna wear for a video, it's a specific choice. It's, a, it's not about, well, I think I look good in this. Mm -hmm. It's what am I trying to say? What's the message I'm trying to deliver? How does that impact what I'm trying to get the audience to think, to feel, or to do? And so right now I'm very casual. I'm in jeans and a black shirt. Now I often wear a lot of black. It's part of our brand identity. Amy wears a lot of white. Amy's my partner and also mm -hmm. my future wife, but she's my business partner in heroic public speaking. She wears a lot of white, I wear a lot of black. And it makes us neutral where our students are the stars. Our mm -hmm. students are the ones of color. And that's a choice that we make. But because I'm here with you at home, I choose to wear a pair of jeans as opposed to, a, it would look weird if I was wearing a suit, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Look a little strange. Yep. But last night uh, I was in DC and I gave a presentation for a big law firm, very mm -hmm. big law firm. And I knew it was gonna be after work. So they were going to become, they were going to come wearing their law firm clothing. You know, those kind of shoes with the tassels. <laughs> you know? Those like old white men shoes, I call them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me, I also am sick and the show must go on. So uh, that's another big part of performance. You know, I was saying to my son yesterday, I said, you know, uh, dads don't get a sick day. It's mm -hmm. just not how it works. You know, you got to do the job at hand and that's part of performance. And I knew that I should choose my dress so that it, they were comfortable with it, but I'm not gonna dress like them because I don't, that's not my dress, but I wear a nice blazer, nice pair of slacks, a sweater underneath, but I'm not gonna go put on a pinstripe, you know, like, uh, what are they called? The, remember the double-breasted suit? Right, from the, yep. I'm gonna go put one of those on to try to be like them. You never try to be somebody else. It's always an expression of who you are, but you amplify different parts of your personality depending on what situation you're in. Right. And they're all choices that you make. So if you can elaborate on that a little bit more, you talk in Steal the Show 
about the difference between looking for approval and looking for results. Yeah, well, that's the performance paradox, isn't it? A lot mm -hmm. of people that go into performance, they want to give speeches, they want to be speakers, they want to be authors, they want to be known, they want approval. Nothing wrong with that. I didn't become an actor you know, 20 years ago because I didn't want approval. I didn't go into it because I didn't want people to stand up and clap. Of course, <laughs> we want approval. That's not a bad thing. Uh, I envy people who have absolutely no need or desire for approval whatsoever. I think it's incredible. One of my friends that I grew up with, he's like, I don't, I don't care what anybody thinks. And he yeah. means it. Uh -huh. He's a very ethical, moral, and lovely guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's also a hedge fund manager. He's one of those types. So he's kind of, uh, he's kind of tough, but the, uh, the, what was I talking about? Uh, approval versus results. Oh, yeah, approval. But the thing is, it's dangerous going after approval. It's very dangerous going after approval because what happens is you start to pander and you start to play it safe. And it's very difficult to be, a performer if you're afraid of criticism because you're going to get criticism mm -hmm. the better known you are and if you're going for results you're constantly going to be thinking about what somebody else wants but the performer's job is to come in and produce something new something creative that is relevant to the people in the room that ultimately is what they want, but they don't often know what they want mm. until they see it. So it's one of the reasons movies are destroyed by focus groups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because a lot of people know what they, they think they know what they like. They don't really know why they, well, they, okay, I'll tell you what, they know what they don't like, <laughs> but they don't necessarily know how to express what they do like. And they often don't know how to tell you how to get to what they like. So you'll get a lot of feedback from people and often the feedback doesn't make any sense uh, because it's actually, it's actually not the right kind of feedback. So somebody will, uh, will come uh, after a presentation and say, well, you know, you, you had too much energy. There was just way too much energy there. And, and what actually happened was that you just were winging it and you were all over the place. And your energy level was great if it was focused. So now next time you go, oh, God, I had too much energy last time. So this time I'm gonna really just play it down. And now you're winging it without being focused and you're very down and low energy. Mm -hmm. And then someone comes up and goes, you didn't have enough energy. You go, oh, <laughs> Jesus, no, I, well, I'm really sorry. Too much energy last time, not enough this time. What should I do next time? And, and yet you don't, but, but what they're looking for is actually more focus, more structure, more organization, and, and they don't know how to express it. And that's why you need a professional to work with who can help you um, translate the kind of feedback that you get. And that's a, that's a skill that takes uh, time. You need to yes. develop it over time. Yes. So I, I just think, you know, you got to ask yourself, what's more important to you, approval or results? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just take having to, sales conversations, for example. If you're worried about approval, you're gonna drop your prices all the time. I, would, I don't want them, I don't wanna seem like, you know, I'm a hard ass about prices, or I don't wanna seem like I don't care, you know, because I really do care. So yep. you know what, I'll just give it to them for half off. Just, so it's not a strategic decision. It's not a, well, this is a good tactic for selling, you know, these services or these products. It's a, I want them to like me. And then, when you do your taxes at the end of the year, you don't like yourself that much <laughs> because you made 50% less than you could have because you gave all this stuff away because you wanted approval rather than focusing on the results. And the truth of the matter is the better results you produce, the more people like you. Yeah. I and mean, that's, you know, that's just all there is to it. So you get it in the end, but not mm -hmm. from everybody. I mean, I've I've had reviews from people, you know, I've written, you know, there's been thousands of reviews on my books over the years. I've got, I had a review once from a lady who said she wanted to slap me. Like <laughs> just that was her whole review. She must have said it 15 times. I just want to slap him. I want to slap him across the face. I'm like, okay. I don't know what I did that was so bad that you want to slap me. You know, yeah. there's nothing you can do about those kind of things. So there's two types of critics. There's the critic in your head and then there's a critic out in the cheap seats. Right. And the critic in the cheap seat is the one who, 
they like to push other people down to lift themselves up. And then there's the critic in your head. The critic in your head is the one that says you're not enough. You're not good enough. You don't know enough. Yep. You'll never be enough. And the louder those voices are, the louder the external critic voices are. And so what we need to do is we need to work on silencing our own voices of judgment by going for the results rather than the approval. That's because you're constantly measuring yourself by how many standing ovations you get or how mm -hmm. many pats on the back you get or how many people tell you the most awesome thing ever in the whole world. Uh, you know, you're going to, you know, those voices of judgment are just going to, you know, spiral out of control because you, you'll be making these assumptions that, you know, like, for example, if you have an audience and, and they're kind of serious after, you know, you give a speech, they're sort of looking at you and thinking like this. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, my God, they hated me. They totally hated me. You go home and you weep and you cry. <laughs> you just sob into a puddle of despair <laughs> on the floor. Meanwhile, they were deep in thought. You were having a real effect on them. Mm -hmm. They just weren't jumping out of their, their seats because they were thinking. And it was really pushing their buttons. And you're going, they're going, okay, I got to think about this. This is, mm -hmm. this is interesting stuff. But they didn't react the way that you wanted them to react. So you, know, you think they didn't like you. And that's what I mean. That's the problem. That's the loop that we get into. And, and I focus on this because I know some of my students have this issue, worry about this. And I know for myself, this is something that I've had to work on over the years to not worry about, you know, that all of those little things about how many pats on the back you get and focus on producing the results. So if I produce the most effective speakers in the business, then I know I'm producing the results. And if one day they're really pissed off at me because I, I really push them hard mm -hmm. and I really tell them the truth and they don't want to talk to me for a week or they leave, you know, the program mm -hmm. for a month because they just hit a wall and, you know, and they weren't willing to break through the wall and they felt like they were being pushed too hard. Fine. Yeah. Cause they'll come back in a month and go, you know what? I am going to make the change. I am going to do this. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of the program, they've pushed through, they've come to a, you know, another side and they are a whole different type of performer and we produce the results. So take Herb Brooks, for example, was the legendary coach of the 1980 U.S. men's hockey team, right. Olympic hockey team, mm -hmm. who beat the Russians. And the Russians had never been beat. They were giants. They were all on steroids. They were <laughs> the best in the world. And at the time, Olympic hockey skaters were not professional skaters they were just college kids right most of them coming out of the boston schools and the wisconsin schools mm -hmm. uh, minnesota and they were rivals all these young kids they hated each other they'd been playing each other for four years in college and they fight all the time big rivalries so when he put them on this team he knew they were going to have a problem skating together and when he was coaching at university of minnesota he was an affable guy a nice guy good mm -hmm. coach good coach to play for and everybody liked him but when he coached the u.s men's hockey team he decided he was going to be a slave driver mm -hmm. a drill sergeant he said i am not your friend you want a friend you can go to my assistant coach i'm not your friend mm -hmm. and he worked them so hard he pushed them to the beyond the point of breaking and he did that because he felt that, well, if they hate me more than they hate each other, they'll bond together, which is mm -hmm. what I need. And when they bond together and they start seeing results, then they will work, then they'll skate for me. Yeah. And I want them to skate for the US, not for their college team. And I want them to skate for each other. And he did it. They won. And it mm -hmm. was it was a miracle. It was one of those feats that nobody thought could happen. And of course, at that time it had you know, ramifications far beyond hockey. It had political right socio you know, uh, global uh, ramifications and uh, and he decided to change his roles change his style of behavior in order to produce the results and he didn't care about getting the, the approval because people were mm -hmm. not happy with him for quite some time the olympic committee didn't like how he was coaching who he was choosing and so on and so forth so the approval thing is huge i mean it is and, and a lot of folks that i work with won't do video because they're afraid they won't look good yeah exactly right you know nobody gives a <laughs> Nobody cares about how you look now, meaning you, you, as I talked about before, you choose the way you look, you want to be like a unshaven, messy, like, 
kind of grungy thing. That's your style. You're going to go with that, build a brand around it, go for it. Mm -hmm. Clean shaven and neat. And you know, that's your style. Go for it. You want to wear a Louis Vuitton, you know, all blinged out. That's your style. Go for it. But it's the audience doesn't care whether or not you look sexy mm -hmm. unless that's your brand, you know, unless you're going for the, I'm too sexy for my shirt thing. <laughs> so these are all choices again, but you know, if you're on stage and you're thinking about, or you're in front of the camera and you're thinking about, well, how does my jaw look? Does my face look fat? You know, mm -hmm. all these things. You're not, you're not serving the audience. You're not delivering on your promise to them. It becomes about you and it's never about you. It's always about them. That's the key. That's what's so important. And anxiety, no, being nervous before presenting is completely normal. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're doing something where you can't take it back. You know, if you're doing audio recording, yep. you can cut it up. All right, let's just stop. Let's cut it and go back. When you're doing video the way we are, you could do it mm -hmm. it's a little harder. I mean, I could say, okay, I screwed up. Let's stop here. Let's go back. And then you've got to cut it in and it's kind of, and mm -hmm. it looks cut in or someone does jump cuts on their videos because yeah. it's like one, they can only get it through one line at a time. So it's mm -hmm. like, boom, boom jump cuts mm -hmm. and the audience is going wait what this doesn't look so it's a if you do it right you've got to be able to roll through it and keep going now now just there's a lot of video that you can do where you're actually filming it like you were filming a commercial or tv show and then that's all edited right We've done for you videos that we do with our students uh, on stage for their speeches the editors make them look brilliant like right students show up uh you know and and on the day, not do their best work, but then you see the video and you go, oh my God, mm -hmm. they're like superstars. Because like, great editors can do that. But the kind of thing we're doing here, or when you're on stage, it only exists in the moment. Right. You can, you can say, okay, let me just say that again because I don't think I articulated it. Well, you can do that. But we get so obsessed about being perfect. And then we start obsessing on ourselves. So we get so anxious. And the more we think about ourselves, more anxious we get and anxiety is not what we want nervousness mm -hmm. is fine i get nervous i even get nervous when i do these things it's completely normal no matter how many i've, I've done probably thousands of these kind of mm -hmm. things over the years <coughs> i still get nervous because i want to do a great job i want people to buy the book i want you know i want to move the business forward i want to serve more people i want to grow and do all those things so i still get a little bit nervous because i care but anxiety is often enthusiasm without the breath nervousness is cool when you stop breathing you're nervous because you're enthusiastic you're excited about the thing you care about it you you want to do well that's great but if you don't breathe and this is why we do a lot of uh, breath work voice work uh, movement work with our students is because often people start holding their breath and you can right. see on camera they start getting really stiff and they don't breathe so let's say I don't take a lot of deep breaths and I, I speak like this, but I, you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of breathing and I sort of just keep talking and you can hear that I'm going to run out of breath and I don't know exactly when I'm supposed to take the next breath or what I'm supposed to do. So I go, and then I take a little breath like that. And then I keep going and, you know, the audience is like, Oh my God, like I'm stressed already. Just even, you know, acting at it for 10 seconds. Yep. But your, your power, your voice, I've been really sick. So my voice might sound sick, a little bit nasal. But the power in, in, in your whole being on stage, on camera, is in your breath. And if you're not breathing when you're performing, uh, then you will get more anxious. And the more anxious you get, the less you breathe. And then you probably pass out, fall down on the floor. <laughs> that to happen. Yeah. So it's relaxation, it's ease, it's comfort in your body. That's what gives you a lot of power. It's the openness that gives you power. You know, the things that take away our power as performers is, uh, is persona, is these like fat layers of persona mm -hmm. that we wrap ourselves up in and think we're cool and, and protect us. But they're just parchment, you know? It's like parchment-like armor that you just know any second somebody's going to pierce it because you're playing at something. Mm -hmm. Actually uh, amplifying really exciting parts of yourself. And that's, that's what we want to do. So the more open you are, the more powerful you are. Actually, the less you can be hurt because your core is where your power is. It's not on the outside. Yeah, it's not in your cleverness. It's in deeply, deeply 
deeply commit, committed, being committed to the people that you serve and going after the results that you want. That's where your power is. And you don't let anybody stop that. You don't let anybody get in the way of that. You know, it's like if you have an audience of 50 people, sometimes there'll be one person over here that doesn't like any, every, like every problem they have is your fault. Like everything <laughs> they hate about the world is your fault. And they, they, they never met you before. This is a speech the first time they ever saw you. But everything that you represent, they hate for whatever reason. And everybody else is like, oh, my God, this is so awesome. What do you do? You go over to that person who doesn't like what you're doing. Is everything okay? Do, can I do something different for you? I, I don't want to. And then the other, you know, 49 people are like, hello. Mm -hmm. What about us? And so that's natural, you know, which would gravitate towards the, the, those critics, but we don't, we were focusing on, we went, there's three different, I talk about this in Steel the Show, there's three different types uh, of audience members. There are people who are already big fans. Uh, they're, they're with you, like they already have the same worldview as you, they love listening to you because it affirms what they believe, they're right on the money with you, they're there. There are, on the other side of the fence, the detractors, the people are like, there's no way I will ever buy into that because you are wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like the conservatives on this side and the liberals mm -hmm. on this side and never the twain shall meet. They just they hate each other. There's just no common ground. It's absolutely unacceptable to have any common ground. And if you do have common ground, if you're a political leader on either side, then you'll lose your seat. Because if you agree with anything that anybody else in the... So, those two sides, you know, they just don't meet. But the point is, there'll be people on that side who just, they will not share your worldview. They're just not interested. But there's a group in the middle, and these are the persuadables. They're the people who are really open to your ideas. They've held probably different ideas for many years, but they see there's something else out there. They're not sure what it is yet. You present it to them, they go, that's interesting. I could see that. I'm not sure if I'm willing to do the work to make that change because that might mean that a lot of the decisions I've had to make will have to change or the decisions I've made weren't right. You know, it starts to, starts to get them a little bit uncomfortable because, you know, change is, is, uh, is uh, the only person, what, uh, uh, the only person, what is the expression? The, uh, the only, the only person that likes a change is a baby with a wet diaper. Yeah. Most, I, don't, I don't even know. I may have heard that. I don't know if I made it up. I have no idea. But, <laughs> The, the, uh, it's, you know, uh, and, and the more you can engage and change, you know, generally the more you can, you know, move forward in your life, but you try to focus on those people in the middle, those persuadables. That's, that's who you're making your case to. Mm -hmm. like, you've already got the fans over here. They're with you. You don't need to pander to them. The people on the other side who just absolutely hate everything about you, forget about it. There's nothing. And I'm, I'm using extremes there. Right. Intent. Like they don't necessarily hate you, but they just want to argue with you. They've got a different point of view as you. You don't spend your time focusing on them. You spend your time focusing on the people in the middle, in the middle who are on the fence. And you believe you can get over to your side of the fence if you make your case well. Makes sense. Yeah. Good stuff, Michael. Tell us where we can get steal the show before we oh, wrap steal up. Steal the show anywhere books are sold. It's uh, on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list right now. If you pick up a copy and you go to stealtheshow.com, there are thousands of dollars in bonuses that you can get. Just one copy will get you over $1,000 in bonuses. There are a documentary master classes where you can watch me work with people on stage uh, for long periods of time. There's a business panels on the business speaking that you can get for free, uh, templates for storytelling, for content creation, uh, and much more. So that's where you pick that up at stealtheshow.com. If you want public speaking help or you want to come to any of our live events around the country, we have a big event in February mm -hmm. uh, in Fort Lauderdale. You were there last year, weren't you? No, I was in California at that point. But uh, Florida, oh, yeah. in well, January sounds, Florida in February sounds pretty appealing. <laughs> it is very appealing. It's a really extraordinary event. We have A-listers, people at the top of the business, uh, and we have people uh, that are just at the beginning of their journey as well. And it's the most incredible environment because here's the rule I have. If anybody talks badly about anybody else, anybody puts anybody down, anybody is dismissive of anybody else, they're gone. Mm -hmm. It's a zero tolerance policy. They get the boot because when you're performing, you need people who support you around you. So we only allow people who are supportive to play in our environments because you will, from time to time, feel uncomfortable going to the next level as a performer. You will wonder if you're doing the right thing. You will be messy. 
and you need people to support you on that journey. So that's very important. So heroicpublicspeaking.com is where you can get access to that. We've got online courses as well that you can start right away uh, and much more immersive graduate level type programs uh, for people who you know, want to take their speaking uh, much farther. Uh, Great stuff. And I've seen, you know, in, I've seen it with my own eyes, the evolution of these people on stage is absolutely amazing. So yeah. get down to Florida in February. Thank you so much, Michael. As always, we appreciate it. Thank you for your insights and your time. And uh, we will see you soon. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.